So welcome everyone. My name is Daljit Hoti. I'm a paediatric nephrologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, and I will be your host today. It's a huge pleasure to welcome three colleagues who will be considered world leaders in the in home HD across the world. Um, and let me introduce you to firstly Sandeep Mitra, he's a professor of nephrology and consultant nephrologist at Manchester University Hospitals in the UK. He's a home and hospital hemodialysis program lead for East Sector Network Greater Manchester. He holds diverse national, international roles and responsibilities, including the chair of the Dialysis Society. And he's the deputy director for the NIHR Health Tech Research Centre and vice chair of UDial. We also have joined us Natalie Borman. She's a consultant nephrologist and clinical lead for a large home hemodialysis program at the Wessex Kidney Centre in Portsmouth. She's the deputy chair and educational lead for the Dialysis Association and a member of the UKKA Home Dialysis Specialist Interest Group. And finally, Dr. Mehmet Kambi is working for the Koch University School of Medicine in Istanbul, Turkey, as the director of nephrology. He's a former board member of UDAL and deeply interested in doing clinical research in hemodialysis, risk factors and management of cardiovascular disease and CKD and hypertension. So welcome all of you. It's a real pleasure to have you here today. So the, the, web, the seminar today is um, a, a, a collaboration between um, UDAL ERA Working Group is a seminar series and today's um, seminar is about home dialysis, how to build a program that works. Sandeep, I believe you're going to start us off today and the way we're going to operate is Sandeep's going to give us a talk on home hemodialysis, how to build a program, followed by a, um, a panelist conversation and these are questions that have already been posed by the members for our panelists and then finally a question and answer session at the end before we close. So I'm hoping that, um, Sandy, if you have your slides ready, it's a real pleasure to invite you to give your talk on home hemodialysis, how to build a program that works. Thank you very much, Daljit, um, and uh, welcome everyone. So I'm gonna kick off this uh, session with an initial sort of presentation on the topic that has been outlined, trying to build a home hemodialysis program that works. Thank you again. So. Um, the reason why this topic has been chosen by you, Dial, is as we try to improve dialysis outcomes, we feel that we need to really emphasize on the different modality options that can be offered to our patients to try and improve the lives that patients lead on dialysis. And as you begin your journey in setting up a program or trying to grow a program that already exists, I think it's important to stick to the founding principles um, around which a home program will thrive, um, typically around these six tenants of uh, trying to improve the offering of patient choice and empowering patients at the underlying principle or philosophy to build a program supported by a strong uh, um, uh, and a structured program in, in an appropriate training environment, being able to offer a flexible and tailored dialysis uh, options, which is evidence-based and have been proven to improve outcomes of dialysis for patients, uh, a key element of that would be to build around it a robust support system for patients. And then this is governed by a quality assurance process that looks at outcomes, but also um, addresses the need for innovation in unmet need areas for each individual program as you advance care. And I'll try and detail some of the aspects within these principles. So the first thing is to actually secure the buy-in, buy-in of the community, buy-in of um, the program directors, bringing up the hospital trusts, and of course the uh, payors or the funders. And I suggest to you that you start with the business case with these three principles again. Why are we trying to build the program bigger or even starting off with a new one? Patient values in terms of activating patients that leads to better outcomes, being able to offer tailored schedules personalized to their needs and their circumstances, giving them more independence while their life is tied to dialysis, avoiding visits to hospitals. And of course, there's evidence that patients who go on home dialysis tend to have much better rehabilitation. But there are important outcome measures for clinicians to look at. A higher dose of dialysis that is now linked to better cardiovascular outcomes and improved fluid balance has to be at the, at the center of what we're trying to do here in terms of achieving better clinical goals. And for the provider or the payer, 
how we balance costs by merging this with an in-center modality, um, reducing the stress on the workforce that is needed increasingly in running these in-center dialysis ships. Of course, environment friendly, as you'd avoid, avoid the hospital journeys three times a week in patients who can't dialyze at home. And in, in put together, it gives greater commissioning value for the money spent in, in offering dialysis. Um, for the patient, for the clinical outcome goals, and for the PR themselves. On the right hand side, you can see a bit of a structure of how to set about the business score and scoring around it. This is how a, a, a final sign off might look like. These are the elements of, along which they would like to assess your proposal. So pay attention to some of these and, and looking at how does it fit in with your current program. Is it achievable? Have you got plans for scaling it up? Uh, what are the risks involved? Are there any mitigating risk factors that have been addressed? And of course, affordability. And these individual sort of items could look different depending on how you are set up within your existing program. So there is no set formula for setting up the business case. I tried writing one. It has to be, it has to be um, very individualized to that uh, program. Here is some evidence that you can quote within the business case that's been putting. So. The, the, the frequent hemodialysis network trial, FHN, showed that there's significant improvements in cardiovascular mask markers uh, and fluid balance markers, improvements in blood pressure, less need for antihypertensive agents, and a reduction in red ventricular mass on switching from thrice weekly dialysis to more frequent dialysis, shorter, more frequent sessions. Of course, this trial was done in the in center setting, but highlights the importance of being able to tailor therapy to improve clinical outcome measures. Uh, so there's strong evidence that the cardiovascular performance of our patients could improve significantly if we were able to tailor the frequency and the time of dialysis. Of course, it comes with a trade-off. For example, there's, there's the, the, the trial, the randomized control trial reported increasing vascular access infections and complications and some of the burden that this might impose on patients at home with a more intensive therapy. So those are some of the mitigating risk factors to highlight in your proposal of how to set up the program. But it's not just about intensive dialysis. Um, survival advantage of home dialysis is not significantly different between conventional and frequent regimens within the home setting. For intensive regimes, of course, there have been some RCTs I've described to you, the, the FHN trial on the previous slide. But in matched cohort studies uh, of both in-center and home HD patients on conventional therapies, um, there are two particular studies that have looked at this home versus hospital on conventional therapy and found improvements in survival independent of the total number of sessions per week. Um, and you can see here, significant reduction in hazard ratio um, for being at home on a conventional therapy as well as on a frequent, frequent therapy at home. Um, and, and, and of course, there is a possibility that there's selection bias in these patients because they're retrospective cohort studies and they may play a role in influencing the results of these studies. Um, however, this element of selection may be an important factor to bear in mind in setting up successful home programs. Uh, but this you can see is a very last study uh, from the ANS data. We advocate that you set the simple message or question very early on in the pre-dialysis journey, the choice between home and hospital, not versus hemodialysis versus PD. This secures, I believe, the necessary engagement for the patient to consider a self-care modality. And, and I think we need to structure our pre-dialysis program such that the patients are able to access all the options of home, or different modalities at home, very at the outset of starting the advanced CKD journey. Here you can see that the patients would typically start not just from the pre-dialysis program, but from failing current other RLT modalities. So it could be from PD that may have uh, stopped functioning well enough, uh, patients coming off conventional programs. And typically these are some of the clinical signs we look for, for inadequacy of thrice weekly conventional regime where home option or switch could be hugely beneficial for the patients. These are some of the criteria that you could use to select these patients at the outset. And of course, patients are coming off a transplant program because of failing graft. So these are potentially the patients that are actually entering the program and going through a, a structured training program such that they can uh, um, consider the option of a home hemodialysis modality. But it's, it's easy to set criteria in this thing and, and, and programs still fail to find patients who would benefit from the home therapy. And in there, 
further intervention is required. So whilst we know the patient population that would that would that would fit the criteria for inclusion into a training program, there is more work that needs to be done in trying to understand these patient perspectives. Um, a flagship project that we did using a very highly experienced member of the home team designated as a navigator role. This was successfully deployed, I think, first in Canadian units to stratify patients, not according to their clinical abilities or clinical performance, but according to their ability, motivation, as well as clinical need. And by doing that, we showed a massive surge in acceptance of home dialysis. Um, the project finished, and, and John Woods, you can see here, um, um, so sort of led a huge transition of patients from conventional therapies to home therapy, um, being self-care or shared care or into the training program. Um, it just gives everybody a chance uh, to help improve outcomes and give them more independence on dialysis. So I'd recommend that you consider not a big team to, to start off with, but a few people who are highly experienced or can gather the experience in what can be offered to patients as a good quality or high quality dialysis. And that, that, that role I think is quite important as you start recruiting patients into the training program. There are defined exclusion and inclusion criteria, not many. For home hemodialysis, the typical exclusion criteria would be somebody who has uncontrolled severe psychiatric illness or has ongoing severe drug or alcohol abuse, um, uh, issues with memory and uh, learning disabilities, um, maybe life expectancy that can be less than six months. Although I've had patients who found it extremely gratifying to be able to move to home in the final phase of their years of life and it's offered as a palliative therapy at home in many countries across the world. Language barrier can be significant exclusion criteria, and that's something that, that exists as a health inequality within the home diagnosis programs. We have not yet cracked it, but that can be a limiting factor. And there are some environmental factors, of course, inability to have storage space, the adequacy of home, finding the right machines to fit in, and water supply can be major limiting factors across different centers worldwide. But other than that, major, most patients with the right motivation, confidence, and ability should go through a training program if they choose to. I've talked about the pre-dialysis phase and how you select patients into the program, but the selection of patients uh, goes on as an onward journey through to training um, in this phase and finally in the monitoring phase. And I think I consider all these four phases, uh, patient choice, clinical selection, training, and at home, being a selection sort of process that is going on in, to, to measure ensure that the patients are getting a better treatment at home by switching from one or the other modality. And that's an ongoing selection process. And it's, it's natural, it's intuitive. And through that, I think we select the best patients to have the best outcomes. And that's not necessarily a bad thing in, in running a home program. It's important to have a dedicated environment of training. The environment matters a lot, I feel, because it needs to be different from a busy dialysis shift. Um, and I think having an area cordoned off to call it the training environment, whether it's been within the main dialysis unit or adjacent to it is important. We have a dedicated training environment that is also evolving in terms of space and staffing. Um, and, and, the, and the learning process requires a different environment to a standard conventional hospital dialysis unit. The steps of learning are very simple, hygiene, being able to connect up the, to the access and to the machine, and of course, some troubleshooting episodes. On the right-hand side, you can see some of the usual cause of training failure. In our program, we let patients take their own time to learn because different patients have different learning styles, and that's often identified right at the outset by the training lead person. There are usually four types of adult learning styles that we tend to um, uh, map onto our training program. So here are some cause of training failure. Of course, if there's a medical condition that that is limiting patient's ability to learn, anxiety, manual dexterity, visual impairment, and adherence issues that may be highlighted or picked up very early on by the training team, con concerned with the fact that this patient may not be suitable for uh, more independent dialysis at home. But these patients, many patients move through the program. The, the failure of training is, is very minimal once the selection process of the pre-dialysis and the navigator nurse role is optimized. Training itself has a lot of components within it. This is our structured training program. It has modules within it, as you can see. And essentially, they are not necessary. They're delivered in this order, but not necessarily always adhere to this order, depending on where the patient is in the training journey. 
you can see that the simple steps of asepsis, hygiene, observations, how to record observations, setting target with our tradition is taught right at the outset. Of course, in this preparation, the mechanics of connecting to analysis, going through access training, whether it be a graft, fistula, or a, or a catheter, and then administering anticoagulation, reinfusion modalities, uh, modes, uh, how to after care, taking somebody, uh, taking oneself off the machine, emergency bullets followed by troubleshooting. Through these steps, there are, at various levels, we do different testing of the learning through quizzes and questions, and patients are then scored and then moved from one level to the other. This is one training program. Most training programs will look like this, but they'll be, have been adapted to their local, local experience and knowledge. So, so it's important to have your own training program, keeping some of these principles intact. Um, and of course, the final bit is, of course, discharge planning, where the patients are then handed over to the community team. And at that stage, patients usually sign a contract of being able to responsibly perform the treatment and, and plans of retraining or monitoring at home are, are clearly established at this stage. What happens then is patients adopt different modalities within the home setting. And it's important to have different choices at home. They don't necessarily require different machines, but they require an approach to be able to tailor the therapy to the patient's need. Um, for example, a patient who's coming off an in-center program, uh, but needs more intensive dialysis, but wishes to stick to a three times a week regime, probably adding a convective dose to the therapy will improve clearances. Uh, um, or patient who wants to avoid large intradiabetic weight gains on the weekends should start off with an alternate data and dialysis. Those who are have got a higher vintage on dialysis require much greater uh, removal of middle molecules and long-term outcomes can be significantly improved by having an nocturnal program at home. And of course, short daily dialysis. So you can see that patients need to choose these things guided by the clinician based on their clinical needs, but also adapted to their clinical home circumstances and their lifestyle. Uh, there are some dialysate systems that use low dialysate flows where the treatment parameters are different in terms of blood flow and, and, and dialysate flow. There's a limited dialysate sac, and therefore these, these parameters do vary. And there are various advantages and disadvantages to these treatment modalities, but generally it's important to find the right fit modality for that patient, test the right therapy for the right patients in the right environment. And, and you know, by and large, I feel in our program, Sunday Circle across the UK, nearly 50% of the patients choose the alternate daytime regime or even more, I think, patients tend to start immediately avoiding the long interdiabetic gap because they start feeling unwell on the Sundays and the Mondays, essentially. And they, they immediately start feeling better by avoiding that large interdiabetic gap, which would be the first objective to start making patients feel better at home. This is a split in our program. You can see that they're well split amongst all the conventional therapies, different hours per week. But the aim is here to go beyond 12 hours per week treatment. And on average, patients have 14 to 15 hours per week. Some on nocturnal treatment would end up having 20 to 24 hours per week. Significantly enhanced amount of dialysis during the week is achieved at home. It's important to understand this is not always very high speed intensive dialysis. In fact, the longer the session exposed on dialysis during the week, the slower the dialysis is. So the ultrafiltration rates are much gentler. The blood flow rates can slow down. Dialysis flow rates often are slowed down. So this is not necessarily high speed dialysis, but it's intensive in terms of the exposure to the dialysis uh, uh, treatment itself. So there's a myth that this is too much of that, too fast to pace the dialysis, but going home actually slows down some of the dialysis parameters and actually makes it more gentler and kinder for the, kinder for the patient. So this is typically the flow of patients. As I said, patients are picked up from different clinical areas and then they go through training for home, then at home and followed by support systems where they, they should be able to access, access um, emergency care uh, for any emergency issues that might happen to them at, at home during dialysis or in between dialysis. Um, clinic visits, typically three to six, every three to six months with healthcare plans are reviewed prescriptions are, are modified as necessary. And of course, this is coupled with community visits by the community team, home visits essentially. And that's an essential component for review of these patients, reviewing them in their home environment. And that's often done by a team of community and dialysis nurses. And at that stage, the patients either stay on the modality of transition or get transplanted. One other important part of the support system is not just the clinical care, but the logistics that are required to support patients at home. Are the supply deliveries working well? And, and whilst we may think that we've got a contract with an industry provider, I often get 
I often get patients reporting that things are not going to plan. Some of the changes in the product and the consumables have, are being difficult to access. I had a patient who needed a different needle to, to needle type to have better pressures or flow pressures in the circuit, but the supply of them were disrupted. And so, and there are supply chain issues as well. So it's important to keep an eye on the deliveries and it's important patient parameter to report on essentially or ask the patients when you're reviewing them. Of course, there's a technical support required for any machine related issues and of course the water softness uh, or, and, and waste disposal. So these are logistics need to be reviewed as well uh, as for per individual patient, but for the program as a whole. When the patients are at home, the exit can take place in different ways. Most commonly is transplantation, of course, um, uh, but there could be other reasons. And you can see here the spread of some of the reasons why patients come off our home HD program. The two big ones are uh, fear of cannulation or not able to sort of cope with cannulation issues, vascular access issues. They are the top issues of patients wanting to switch back into a um, uh, more assistive setting like in center dialysis. There are several others as well. But one of the important things to bear in mind is that many of these factors can be intervened and patients can be maintained at home with a good support structure. And by that, I mean the important bit to sort of measure objectively is often the adherence to the treatment. Many of them stem from and lead to non-adherence. And so addressing some of these procedure related issues that may be affecting adherence, therefore clinical outcomes and well-being, but also patient anxiety need to be addressed, burden of tasks, needle phobia, et cetera. Psychosocial issues need to be understood. And here the home visits can be extremely important in giving us a guidance of what might be the most impressing factor in the patient's life that we need to address and might be affecting dialysis outcomes and practice of dialysis at home. Other attitudes of risk, et cetera, are important. So by having a very good support system, addressing and mitigating some of the risks of adherence and there's issues associated with them, one can actually reduce program exits that are avoidable. Uh, this is a publication from our program led by Anjayanti who demonstrated that actually the technique survival home instance is far superior to most of the dialysis modalities. Um, um, very high success rate with a good training program and a great uh, and a robust support system in home dialysis, you know, compared to PD or in center dialysis. Um, but there are dropouts, as I mentioned, most often due to the right reasons, many patients will move on to transplantation. We assess transplantation chances for all our patients on home dialysis if they're eligible. But of course, there are some others like care fatigue, technique failure, and non dialysis factors that comprise this curve that you see. As you embark on the program, you'll see this, this typical curve. There's a bit of a honeymoon phase when the program suddenly doubles in size and then it reaches a plateau phase here. And that's a typical seen as you start off building a program. It can be difficult to start off with, but success is seen very soon. And, um, but as the program grows, it's important to make sure that the patient's transitions are well looked into. These are the four phases of transition that we might encounter when your program has grown to a sufficient size or, or um, uh, 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 numbers. So of course, we've talked about starting training, transitioning to home, but there's transitioning back home, from home to hospital and back into a home setting. So these transitions must be managed carefully. And you need some experienced nurses and clinicians to identify the need for these transitions to maintain the patients at home. At every transition, the goal here is to restore patients independence on dialysis at home. And therefore, you know, they need to be preemptively managed um, um, in an effective way. Then when the program grows in size, of course, there are other challenges as you, as you start recruiting patients of different capabilities, different comorbidities, and, and different circumstances, you might need to set up a solo home analysis program at home, which we do have, um, and about 20% of our patients are often on solo dialysis. And you can see here, we have a slightly different strategy in trying to maintain the risk of quality assurance and mitigation of risk for somebody who's not got a carer at home. These are some of the strategies we adopt and follow them up more closely. All our machines are capped at an ultra filtration rate of not more than 500 mils an hour, which means that patients can take more off, but over a longer period of time, but they cannot actually dial in large ultrafiltration rates. It's capped to the machines. But these are some of the maneuver strategies you can see, you can adopt to try and ensure that your whole solar dialysis program is safe uh, uh, 
to carry on. Again, you start recruiting patients with lots of comorbidities. This is just a, just a sort of cartoon of some of the comorbidities we manage in our patients who are dialyzing at home. You can see it's quite a handful. And patients of much higher age, older age are also in our program. Um, and you can see this study from, from Cornell has showed that in the, in, the, in the older age group, you know, this is pulled together four centers across the world, uh, Canada, Manchester, and, and UK, and, and of course, Europe into centers showing this is sort of up to four years, they tend to do really well, um, but there are challenges for older patients to go on these therapies and, and, and you need to have strategies to try and um, address them depending on the type of dialysis program uh, you're looking after. But at the startup, it's obviously selecting the first cohort of patients. And here is a sort of a rough guide to where the first patients might come from. Usually motivated, committed to go home, usually come and approach the teams and can I do this at home? have obviously a suitable home or physically if you're unable to dial as independently, good vascular access, no major health related complications and good concordance are the first patients that will deliver success in, this, in, in, in setting up the home program. The three major issues in sustaining big home programs is making sure the cultural change is systematic and not just a one-off um, from a particular champion or enthusiast in the program, that your you empowerment program is very solidly built around patient choice and training strategies, and of course, cost in supporting the pathway. These are some of the sort of areas to all of these can be addressed by breaking them down to small uh, tasks or projects, as I would call it. And, and your program may need one or two or three of these addressing, and they're never the same in every program. Uh, you know, for example, identifying local deficiencies may be one project that you want to embark on. How do you empower and skill your staff? How do you start sharing your success and failures with your peers within the network or in your neighboring units? So there are different sort of subset of projects you can take to bring about that systematic sort of change that will last for, for, for a long period to come. And the bit I would like to emphasize here, those changes and those next thing approaches must come at a time when you're doing well, not things when things are not working well, because that way you build up the momentum and increase the size of your program. This is not the right time to rethink strategy of what we do next. It's far too late. Just to finish off, the way I see home hemodialysis by looking after these patients, you know, um, it's a highly rewarding dialysis modality. For patients, for good outcomes, for clinicians, to see patients thrive on dialysis, and of course, for the peers. It can accommodate a full spectrum of hemodialysis from conventional to invent intensified regimes. So it gives you a real opportunity to customize dialysis, tailor it to their personal um, uh, biological uh, needs. It's of course uninterrupted. Patients end up getting a higher dose of dialysis. Um, and it's a personalized model. It's an individual's model of care, which provides a unique opportunity to better educate patients on their treatment needs. And the role that dialysis plays in their clinical condition, that's often underplayed and underestimated by patients, because, because education is not provided in a comprehensive way. So, and you see more patients becoming more compliant with dialysis as they become more familiar with the therapy regime being able to achieve a balance between his or her needs and preferences is what makes a therapy really ideal for patients on dialysis for a long period of time. I just want to give you some couple of um, further reading sort of guidance. These are two manuals um, uh, that you could sort of get access to. There are chapters on home dialysis, different elements and modules to just further your knowledge, establish your, and use it as a reference point as you set up your program and grow it further. Thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Dan. Thank you, Sandy. That was a wonderful talk. Um, and very comprehensive and very clear. I really appreciate that. So um, if I could ask you all who are listening, please to put any questions you have for Sandy or any of the panelists in the Q&A section of Zoom. Before we go to your questions, um, I will now um, facilitate a panel discussion with some questions that were posed to the panelists in advance of today. So um, if I can just start with some of the first questions, really. Um, the first one's for you, Sandy. What are the most frequent difficulties in cannulation that you've experienced at home? And what is your approach for sustaining a lifetime vascular access? Thank you, Joel. Um really a key question because vascular access is, is also the Achilles heel of, of home dialysis. You know, and uh, 
Um, I think the important thing is to get the ideal vascular access in the patients. And it's interesting to note that patients could dialyze both with a fistula or a graft or a catheter, equally capable of dialysis, and they're both safe in the home setting. But the challenge is to de determine the best type of needling, for example, for these patients. And there are tools available where you can use some guidance as to how to determine the right type of cannulation in this patient, whether it's button holding or a rope dialer technique, uh, so that it's the right therapy for these patients. Uh, so fistula cannulation method is important, I think, that fits in with the patient's ability to cannulate is important. Pain with needling is a big issue. Strategies must be developed to try and use some local, uh, you know, some topical agents, et cetera, before dialysis um, to avoid. But generally, we don't tend to advise on injection of lidocaine generally, and patients usually manage with different uh, agents. One issue might be cannulation dependencies. Um, patients often become very dependent on switching between button holes and things, and they require a lot of community support. And that's a red flag that this patient needs further retraining, perhaps in Axmax. So you cannot have a lot of support going on in the home setting. Patients need to be independent and confident with the support. Fear of needles, I've said already, and we all know is a big issue. But I feel that it's never an issue that will stop patients from going home. We treat a lot of patients with fear of needles or cannulation, fear of needles uh, phobia. And it's important to have a stepwise approach. Um, and there are different uh, gadgets and tools you can use. For example, you know, um, using videos to show how cannulation takes place, not just asking them to start you know, cannulating, for example. It's, it's scary to do that for any one of us, I think. Holding the needle sometimes for a few sessions is, is good enough to overcome the threshold or the barrier to you know, that exists of the patients. So your lead trainer will have to adopt some of these strategies for those difficult patients. Many of them will have to, will be scared to cannulate themselves. So becoming familiar with needles and looking at the technique, et cetera, is a, is a great way to do that. So that's not difficult cannulation. And in the long term, I think it's important to keep an eye on the performance of access. So audits are important. One big area I would like you to concentrate on, I think those who are running these programs would know this very well, is adherence or concordance to practice. When become, patients become a master of their own trade, there are often deviations and slippages, and they lead to complications. Even an expert patient needs guidance. So audit, deviation practice, infection rates, rates of bleeding or near misses, um, you know, uh, and these are some of the under cannulation strategies. Have a, have a surveillance program that is more than just doing ultrasound scans, but looks around practice of use of ABF and catheters. Sorry, so, it's a short um, answer of so many of the issues that plague us in, in home dialysis. Thank you, Sandy. So good training, effective training, but also some, some kind of assurance measures to make sure that their practice is as good as it can be. A quick question then, if somebody's having repeated infections at home, is that a, a reason to bring them back in centre? Um, it does need addressing. There could be clinical reasons why they are getting an infection. For example, there could be a biofilm in the line or some uh, you know, up, abscess under the buttonhole needle. So that's the clinical reason to bring them in and treat them comprehensively. There could be non-clinical reasons such as adherence issues. Um, so it's important to distinguish between the two and both of them need attention, but in different ways. One probably needs admission and more intensive treatment. The other needs more addressing some of the training issues, adherence and compliance with it. So yes, all of them need attention, but in different ways perhaps. And keep an open mind. Thank you for that. Um, Nasty question for you. What practical steps or recommendations can you take to improve recruitment of new patients to really help to develop your home program and sustain it? Yeah, thanks, Dal. And I, I appreciate Sandeep's covered some of this in his talk, but I think it's really, really crucial that we separate recruitment of patients into two phases. There's the recruitment of patients when you're starting a brand new program. And really, when you're starting a brand new program, you as a dialysis team need to make sure that you're growing your confidence as well. And you're working out the best way to train and manage these patients, because regardless of what you follow, you have to find your own feet. So in order to get that initial success, you want to be looking at those patients who are motivated, who have good vascular access, whatever that looks like, um, who are either very much independent themselves, who have a very committed care partner that wants to do the dialysis for them. Um, and probably the best things to look at is who have you got in your centres at the moment, who's already doing a portion of shared care or self-care in centre, and having that conversation with them about whether they want to take the next step to home. I think 
if you don't go for your successes in the first instance, you could easily start and stop a programme because you'll feel that this isn't working and that isn't working. But actually, you want those initial successes so that you can feel that confidence with having a home programme. But, and this is the big but, if that's all you ever go after, you will have a very small successful home programme, which will be a few patients and you'll soon run out of your recruitment pipeline. And as we all know with the data that shows, we have an aging population, we have a comorbid population, and actually some of those patients have the most to gain from being on home dialysis because they won't be on a transplant waiting list and they won't be the patients that, that tolerate dialysis particularly well. So if you want a, a good, successful, long-term home dialysis programme, you have to very quickly extend that recruitment to all patients that are willing to try home dialysis. Thank you, Natalie. Um, maybe the question for Mehmet and, and Sandeep, but I'll start with you, Sandeep. What way do you think industry could help establish home programmes and support those who are trying to kickstart that home HD programme? For those who are starting programmes, industry plays a very key role, I think, uh, because um, it's not just a device that you obviously need to choose a particular device to introduce into the programme. Um, um, and, and really it could be one of the several now devices available which are now approved for home use as well. So the field has really moved on in terms of innovation and technology. But I think with that is required ability to create that pipeline of patients adopting or wanting to train and moving through a training program. So the early phase of recruitment could be supported by the industry, I think. And I've seen real successes uh, in, in, in the past and previous programs. So I think industry needs to be an active role in helping these uh, teams grow their experience, which, you know, and also help recruit uh, uh, patients, you know, and then so, uh, so it's a very mutual sort of collaborative approach. I think that is a win-win for everyone. Uh, and then the team, when it's you know, up and running and they've got a sleep for patients, they can build it accordingly, essentially. But the industry plays a really key role in, in helping get the program pipeline up and running. Not Thank just finding, as Natalie said, not just the first few cohort of patients. And, and maybe, I mean, there's a, an argument maybe for assisted home HD. Where is, can industry support an assisted type of model? Is that the responsibility of the organisation or is that an, uh, perhaps an industry support? Yes, uh, I may answer according to the, my country situation. Uh, it mainly depends on the national health uh, care policies, and uh, this is mainly related with economical issues and also local issues. So if you cannot be able to solve the cost problem, first of all, you cannot be able to recommend such a therapy to our, your patients. This is the main problem. And the second part is in low and middle income countries, unfortunately, the prevalence of the home dialysis patients is less than 1%. Uh, because of this, the, uh, there isn't any uh, education or fellowship. This is not a, a part of fellowship training program. That's why none of nephrologists have an idea or have an experience with uh, home dialysis. And this is a big problem while you recommending such a therapy to your patients. If you don't know, how can you recommend or how you believe this is a good option for your patients? And uh, the third issue is you have to have a dedicated uh, training home dialysis center in your institution. And you have dedicated nephrologists dedicated nurse and uh, all doctor and nurse should be available 24 hours for these kind of patients. If you cannot be able to support this kind of condition, this is not a good option. And as you mentioned, the companies should be part of this kind of therapy and should support us as much as possible. Thank you. And Natalie, just a quick question about this assisted home HD model. Is there any models that you know that exist and is the models you've used? Yeah, so I think I think it's a fantastic question and one that we come back to time and time again, because in the UK, certainly we have a very good assisted PD programme. 
um, where we have people that go and set up the PD for our patients. The problem being, of course, with home hemodialysis is where does that end? Because with PD, it's usually set up of equipment and the patients will connect and disconnect themselves or have a care partner that does it. But of course, with home hemodialysis, if we're anticipating that a nurse will stay for the duration of therapy, then it becomes quickly an unaffordable model, particularly um, where you have a big geographical area. But there are a couple of places which have seen some success with this. So I know in France, they did an excellent pilot study where they looked at assisted cannulation in the home setting. So a little bit similar to the PD model where the nurses were going in to simply assist with the cannulation part, um, helping the patients to get onto dialysis, but then leaving so that the patient would support the rest of the session themselves and their um, removal from dialysis at the end. And actually there's been some really good successes in the UK at looking at nursing home led home dialysis. Um, and I'll give you an example where this has been really successful in our programme. We had a, a adult patient with severe learning difficulties who became really distressed every time they came to a dialysis centre. So we have trained his carers. These are non-medical carers in that nursing home, there's a selection of five of them that provide all of his dialysis in the, in the home setting for him. And I think there's a huge opportunity without huge increasing costs for us to be looking at other care providers um, for patients who are in supported living who could provide that model for, for patients. So Mehmet, thank you for bringing in this issue of cost because that's a huge issue in uptake of home hemodialysis. Maybe it's a, a practice for those who've got money. Um, and even those who've got money, Natalie, we're facing these issues of cost of living, the rising cost of living. Um, so what's your view now on um, reimbursing patients for, for example, the energy they're using? Um, should we be considering warm home prescriptions? So how do we support families um, with this rising cost of living? Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. And actually, it's one that certainly in our centre, we've taken a big U-turn on because when we started our programme, um, we had low flow dialysis machines and actually the cost of electricity and water was absolutely minimal. But of course, as time has gone on, we have some diversification in our in our machine usage, but also the cost of electricity is now so great that we cannot expect our patients to front that cost. Um, and I think, you know, we're really clear in the UK that no patient should be out of pocket through choosing to do a home therapy. And therefore, that means that we have a responsibility to those individuals to make sure that the cost of their electricity and water for their dialysis is reimbursed. I think the question around prescriptions for warm homes is a really tricky one because I don't think that this can apply, be applied solely to home dialysis patients because of course all of our patients um, may struggle the same burden of heating their homes. Um, you know, only last week I saw a patient in clinic who couldn't afford to replace their cooking facilities so they were really struggling. And sadly we're in a difficult situation where healthcare in most countries is not funded to deal with people's social issues as well as their medical issues. So unfortunately, we're not in a position at the moment where we can prescribe warm homes. However, we are working closely in the UK with our renal charities who have been absolutely fantastic in providing um, emergency bursaries for patients to make sure that they can cope with the cost of living crisis. And we work in partnership with them to, to make sure that our patients get what they need. Thank you. And Sandy, should we be reimbursing those while they are training for home HD? There's a considerable amount of time, could be four to six weeks to train. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes longer, um, depending on how the program is being designed. So um, they, they, there have been two sides of the argument on that. You know, there's, it's not typically reimbursed, certainly not in the UK, and it's because the patients are already on a dialysis treatment, and that's reimbursed. Question is, there needs to be an additional amount of reimbursement to ability to nurse to retrain because those nursing ratios need to be much um, higher you know, uh, than, than is otherwise recommended for conventional dialysis. So, so there may be sort of additional supplementation to support the training aspect of it rather than the hemodialysis reimbursement, which is typically the same. We tend to train them three times a week like conventional dialysis and the other days they just go through an education program. 
but there is a significant chunk of time taken out. So there is a case to actually say that there is an additional sort of um, top up required to support the training team to deliver quality training at a faster pace. But that's 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 emerging thinking at the moment, not been actioned I, as far as I know in any program. Certainly in PD, I think once they are chosen PD and gone on to a PD program, they're considered to be on PD as a modality, I think. But that's a very short training program. In hematology is slightly different, but the same principles apply that they've actually committed to becoming a home patient. And the tariff really should start at that point. Thank you. Mehmet, there's um, a question about machines and water purification. I mean, what machines and water purification systems do you use across Europe for home HD? Well, uh, there are some simple, small, portable, easy to use dialysis machines and water purification systems. In my country, uh, dialysis companies uh, gives uh, to you free of charge, but in my country, this is a big issue. You have to pay uh, all expenses. And that's why, why we are recommending these kind of therapies to our patients. We have to tell that you have to pay your water, your electrical uh, cost uh, without any support. And some of them could not be able to cover these kind of expenses. That's why this is a big problem. As a conclusion, there are small machines easy to use and the company supports to you. Thank you. And Sandeep, um, choices of machines and perhaps water purification systems yeah. in the UK? Yeah, I think generally that there's two categories of machines. One that do the conventional type of dialysis with high flow of dialysate and can also take different types of blood flow rates. And there's another group of machines where there is limit to the dialysis volume made up for by made up for by either higher blood flow rate or more frequent treatments or more longer lengths of time which is more you know feasible in a home setting so they're not limiting they, they have a great role to play in home dialysis but th these machines offer a type of treatment that must suit the patient essentially so i have to say and the third factor is patient choice patient do like to go into some machines. You know, we did a showcase of a machine, I remember, early on in the program, and that suddenly there was a huge uptake because they liked just the look of the machine. So there's increasing sort of um, um, drive to make machines look more home-like, essentially, and that sort of increases the uptake and the, the likability, if you want, to, of, of the modality. So machines do play a role, but this is determined by contracts and tender, essentially. You know, there are a lot of industry offerings at the moment go for the one that you think is most accessible within your region or patch um, and, 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 um, and work collaboratively with industry to make sure. And you'll soon find the difference is that when you have a very mature program, lots of patients with different dialysis needs, you need probably more than one machine type to deliver different amounts of dialysis. That's a more complex part of the dialysis program. And we have two three machines now to offer just so that we can Catered to those so it's individualizing the machine as well to an extent. But that's when your machine is really, program is really mature and running well. At the start, you need one machine to get that first cohort of patients through the program and start feeling better and doing well. I mean, the thing to add to this is that there's a huge initiative from healthcare systems and governments across the world to promote home dialysis. It's every corner of the world, every healthcare system and government is lighting legislation and policies, asking community, renal community to promote home dialysis. There's never been a better time to start writing business case and look at this properly for your patients. Uh, and you might get a lot of support from the non-clinical sort of partners in this, you know, from the policy managers, finance teams, and from government and trust uh, CEOs to do this. So there's a really sort of, you know, the right time to embark on either setting one up or growing one with in collaboration with the industry. So a very practical question. Um, perhaps I can ask um, you, Natalie, how do you dispose of waste from home, sharps, the lines containing blood? So how do you, how do, you do all that side of things? Yeah, I think um, very good question. Unfortunately, it's going to be one of those things that will be different depending on which country you live in. Certainly in the UK, we have an agreement with our local authorities. Um, we have to inform them that the patients are doing treatment at home and then they will provide a collection for um, your products that have 
blood related products or a particular and it's different from your domestic waste and then again sharp spins will be collected as well so we just need to make that contact with them and make sure that our local authorities will do it but I know it is very different in different countries particularly having had a lot of patients of mine travel around Europe we need to make different agreements in each country that they travel to to make sure that the waste is is disposed of according to the local regulations. And Sandy, is there a difference in outcomes between conventional home HD and nocturnal hemodialysis in centre? In centre? Um, well, as, as you know, there was an attempt at RCT uh, through, the, through the FHN trial to try and look at the answer to that question. And that didn't sort of, wasn't powered enough to look at the difference. Um, so the jury is out, I think, in centre as to how, um, what sort of clinical outcome measures you can look at, but there is sufficient evidence that uh, the patients do experience an improved quality of life um, just by freeing up their data and being able to rehabilitate it better, be, go back in jobs, et cetera, spend more time with family and have a better dialysis. So there is, there are other parameters of more holistic care that might benefit from actually switching from conventional to nocturnal dialysis. In fact, there's an ongoing RCT funded by NIHR in the UK, as you know, Dale, which is looking at randomized trial of conventional three times a week daytime versus longer nocturnal incentive three times a week. That study is in the process of you know, running at the moment. And there's a follow-up with an endpoint of quality of life. So we need to move away from just measuring KTOVs and potassiums to adding to it the impact of the on patient lives. And there's a significant benefit to them, then it's definitely worth uh, you know, a shout in programs that we run. The more diverse we have our program on dialysis, the better will be the outcomes. And a quality of life improvement will lead to a better patient and a better outcome, I believe. Yeah, I mean, what matters to one patient may be very different to what matters to another patient. It's really important, isn't it? A final question to all three of you, perhaps. Um, this is a question about the fact that when you're given patients choice, and moving them from a pre dialysis unit to a dialysis therapy, it can be quite difficult to get them to a home dialysis, home hemodialysis program direct from a pre dialysis unit because of the fear of blood and needles, et cetera. And so they favor PD over a home HD program. So how can you get past that issue? How do you get patients from pre dialysis to a home hemodialysis program? Who wants to start? It's our final question. So I think, Dal, I'm, I'm happy to start, but Sandy, you also definitely have some experience with this, but I think this is really a place where having some sort of transitional care model does come into play because the concern and a lot of units, certainly in the UK and across Europe now, once the patient starts on conventional dialysis, they start on conventional dialysis, and then it's a real effort to try and get them back out of the centre. But I think if patients start, and it's a model that they've been really successful with in the US, they start in a training facility. And that training facility will be, um, it may involve conventional hemodialysis, but you'll be looking at the people that are training or starting to try home hemodialysis. And you'll have the opportunity in that early time to say, well, why don't you have a couple of sessions on that different machine? And, and patients start to ask, what's that patient doing? Why can't I do that? So I think that real visual, being able to see what other people are doing, but patients questioning and us helping them question, why can't I do that is a really good way of doing it. I think there is patients that are absolutely ready and willing to just go straight onto home training. And we've been quite successful in doing that, um, particularly as you see patients who aren't on their first go through this, patients who have been transplanted and are uh, unfortunately failing their transplants, they know because they've done it before. And actually, we're picking up quite a lot of patients through that route. But that C model, that, that model where patients can see what's going on and have that opportunity early on, which I'll maybe hand over to Sandeep, because I know you're running a similar model in, in Manchester to capture those patients now. Yeah, it does. thank you. That I totally agree with you there. I, I, what, what I think is important to have a very good pre-dialysis setup and care. That is half the battle won. Often these things are not working very well because the pre-dialysis setup isn't quite robust enough. You know, people offering the pre-dialysis care, looking after these patients, are not able to comfortably talk about different modalities and offer the choice. So we do use the word choice in a slightly looser way than it should. 
So this is guided decision making. Patients need to be guided into what are the modalities that would suit into their lifestyle. And my feeling is that people either choose PD or home HD at that phase with a good pre-dialysis program or don't. They either choose a home or a hospital modality. And as Natalie's mentioned, what we've done is people who are undecided and the literature suggests that more than 50% of patients are not sure what they want to be on. This is not about choice. This, their choice is also to be not sure what, what that is. A, that is a perfectly acceptable choice. When you haven't got lived experience of a, such a complex treatment such as dialysis, if perfectly okay, we say, to not be sure what they want to do. Uh, and therefore, these patients need to be in an environment starting dialysis where the concept of home is encouraged and, and, and disseminated in the right way. Patients are given option to learn basic elements of it, the stage one and two of the training program. And we're finding that at least 30% of them in the first year has moved to a home but actually has never gone to the incentive program. These patients would by and large have gone into an incentive program by default modality as Mehmet was describing, as it exists today. So we really have to change the patient pathway if you want to do this well. And I think clinicians, and by that I mean doctors and nurses, really need to take ownership of this, um, learn from other units and build a program that will suit them. But patients are essentially looking for the best therapy option for themselves, and we can decide that for them along with them as well. Thank you. Now, there are a few more questions on the Q&A. If I can ask the panellists to answer any remaining questions, that would be helpful, because we're now approaching um, the end of our time together. Um, I think it's very clear from everything I've heard today that there is a huge commitment to developing a sustainable home hemodialysis programme. But the benefits and the value added, both for an organisation, for patients, can be immense. So even though there may be a requirement and actually energy that needs to be put into the program, it's definitely worth it um, if you get this right for our patients. So thank you all for um, contributing to this wonderful seminar today.